Hello everyone, uh, welcome to uh, part 4 of uh, Flying the Airbus A320. Uh, so far we've gone through just about everything. Uh, we've gone about how I do flight planning, we've gone how I do setup, we've programmed our flight management system. Everything is pretty much ready to go. I know people in the comments complain about me with MCDU, FMS, FMC, computer, MCP, uh, OMG, W, no I'm not going to say it. But um, again, in the general way, like I said, this is me. I don't fly these things for a living, I do exactly what makes sense. So at this point, everything has been programmed. Our flight management system is set up. Everything's ready. Our MCP has been set up. Every, we basically just have to go. So let's go ahead and uh, today we're going to be concentrating on startup as well as takeoff. So what we're going to do is first things first, uh, whenever we're starting up, we always start up from the APU, unless there's a reason for a high pressure start. We almost never need to do that in the real world. So to do that, what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn on our two batteries, and I'm actually going to disconnect the external power. We can actually use external power in order to fire up the APU, but it's not critical. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to come over here where it says master switch. I'm going to go ahead and press that button. Pushing that button basically opens up a little door in the back of the airplane that lets air come into our APU. What an APU is, is basically a fancy system that allows us to have almost like a little mini engine on board. Of course, uh, whenever we're working on the APU, uh, we want to make sure we go ahead and open up the left side fuel pumps. Uh, the reason we're doing this is because, if you remember, our APU sucks fuel out of the left side of the airplane. Now that that's been activated, we're going to go ahead and come over to here and flip on both our navigation logo lights, just to be nice. We're also going to go ahead and flick on our, normally it would be our navigation lights, but I'm going to flip up my wing lights here. This should be more than enough lights to kind of let everybody know that we're going to have hydraulic pressure. And again, I've got the little distinctive red light saying, hey, my hydraulic pumps are working. Now you're saying, wait a minute, you said I... APU. Well, bad news. We can't turn the hydraulic pumps on or off. So as long as those are on, we have to kind of let everybody know that they're working. All right. Now to start the APU, simplest thing in the world. We just go boop and push that button just like that. And as soon as you do that, it's going to go ahead and get that thing on rocking pretty much right away. Unfortunately, we can't bring up the APU page down here on the ECAM. Ah! which is kind of a shame because it would tell us exactly what RPM the system is working on and kind of let us know that it's working. But what we do know is if we go to the fuel page, you're going to start seeing the left side uh, fuel quantity come down because the APU is a little tiny gas turbine. It is going to be inhaling fuel in pretty big quantities here pretty quickly, especially when we ask it to start up. I'm just going to go ahead and give it a moment to kind of catch up. And I believe the APU is now running. And it says the word avail, which means that we're pretty much ready to go. Go ahead and push it. And that system will all go get all fired up and ready to go. Okay, with that being said, uh, now we want to go ahead and turn on the APU bleed. Of course, the APU bleed is just going to suck air away from the APU system and provide it into both our engines. Uh, starting this engine is not done electrically. Uh, starting this aircraft is done completely basically by going ahead and uh, pulling air. I think I accidentally pushed this button twice. I'm sorry. It's going to be pulling air out of the APU, jamming it into the two engines and getting them working. Now, interestingly enough, with this particular simulation of this aircraft, we can actually start both engines at the same time, which I'm actually going to take advantage of. So I'm going to come up here. Of course, we want to turn on our beacon light just to give everybody a heads up that, hey, we're about to start our engines. But before I start our engines, uh, this is kind of an interesting little thing here. Um, we generally start our engines as we're being backed up. I know that seems like, oh, this is a little strange. I know that sounds a little weird, but generally um, when we're sucking stuff into an engine, especially engines of this size, anything close by tends to get sucked in with it. So we always try to give ourselves as much room as possible. And the other thing too is we're trying to save fuel. So why start the thing up right away if we're not going to be needing to use it until a little bit, a little bit later on? So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go ahead and call up the ground real fast. I'm gonna ask them to go ahead and push us back. Mark Ibo, ground thread, six, four, requesting pushback. And we're going to ask them to push us back to the left also. Now, the interesting thing is this is the world's fastest pushback. By the way, you cannot be pushed back if your parking brake is engaged. So make sure you disengage your parking brake. Now, in the real world, we'd have to come up here and worry about our INS and everything like that. We don't have to here because of the fact that it's just not a simulated system. All right, let's get this thing starting. Super duper simple process here. We're going to do both engines at the same time, which I know most people will look at me and go, oh, one of those things. But um, fortunately, they left us with the ability to do so. So um, for those people who just gassed, I will turn one engine on at a time. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to crank this over to the ignition start position, and I'm going to turn on the master switch. Normally, we have to mash this button here, but we're not going to worry about that today. As soon as we click that on, that's going to go ahead and fire this thing up. We have two different turbines we're interested in. We have the big blade in the front, which is the N1, and we have the little blade in the back, which is the N2. You can see this thing is spinning up, but there's no fuel flow yet because we haven't actually turned the fuel on. The fuel turns itself on automatically once you exceed a certain RPM. How do we know the fuel got turned on? Because you silly, silly person forgot to turn on the fuel. Please don't make that mistake. Those pumps should have been turned on before we got to that point. But what will happen is the fuel will be introduced once we get to 30%. It'll fire up the exhaust gas temperature. How You can tell it's working. And now, of course, um, we're in a good position here. I'm going to go ahead and tell them to stop pushing me. 
Unfortunately, by the time they stop pushing me, I'll be I'll probably be pushed back into the next town. So I'm going to go ahead and engage the parking brake real quick like that as well. So my big mistake there is I'm not going to go back and fix it. Turn the fuel pumps on before you start the engines. So now our engines are started up quite nicely. You can see that my little turbine in the back is spinning nicely. I've got pretty good temperature. In the event that this started shooting up into the red, you'd have to run down here as fast as you can and slap this lever off. And of course, you can see my main engine's turning at about 20% of its maximum RPM. Coming down here, we're going to start number two, or number one, I should say. I'll just go ahead and left-click on this once. It's going to get that thing turning pretty much right away. The neat thing here is in the real plane, because one engine is now running, the air pressure coming out of this engine would now feed with the air pressure coming out of the APU into the front engine, which would cause it to spin up a little tiny bit faster. Give that just a few moments to go ahead and get us going. You can see it's spinning up again. No fuel has been introduced yet at this time. We're still waiting for that uh, magical point. All of a sudden, the fuel flow gets turned on. A little bit of fuel comes rushing, and whoosh. You can tell we've got a good light off because the temperature starts coming up extremely quickly. We can always come out back, too, and I'll watch the little uh, heat coming out of the back of it to tell us the engine is running. But we can also take a look right here at this handy-dandy instrument. So that's all preset. That's all ready to go. I'd like to go ahead and do kind of some uh, kind of little housekeeping things here. I'll make sure our air pressure has been set. Our Q&H has been set. We want to make sure our flaps are going to be set correctly uh, once we get up enough pressure going here. And we need just a couple more RPM out of this engine. That'll do it. Click, click. We're going to actually be using no flaps for takeoff, so I misspoke there. We're going to come up top. We're going to go ahead and turn on our taxi light just to kind of give everybody a heads up that we're going. I like to turn on the runway turnoff light, especially if it's nighttime, but again, do whatever works for you. Once everything is working, I'm just going to confirm our engines are started. I'm going to reach up here. I'm going to go ahead and shut off our mode here. You can leave this on to ignition mode during takeoff for safety. And I'm going to reach above our head, and I'm going to once click on the master switch. Now, the interesting thing here is uh, with our fuel pumps on, there's no fuel in the middle tank. So we could actually shut these two pumps off and they're not doing us any good. Doing this uh, doesn't hurt anything because, like I said, because there's no fuel in them. Another problem we've created uh, with our little nasty startup here is if we go to the fuel page, is we notice we have a fuel imbalance. If we wanted to try to correct that, we could actually come up here and do a quick little cross feed where we'd actually feed fuel from both engines connected to each other. Uh, this is an effective technique. It works fairly well. Okay, so everything's been set. Our lights are set. The aircraft engines are running, despite my effort to try to kill us all. And everything is looking pretty good. By the way, these aircraft engines pumps are powerful enough to start themselves, even if you don't turn on the electric fuel pump. It's just considered good practice. Okay, normally what we do, of course, is uh, we'd ask them very, very nicely for some permission to go ahead and uh, taxi to our runway. This is kind of an interesting airport as far as runways goes, because um, typically what they do is they use one runway to back taxi for the other runway. So it creates kind of an interesting little situation here. Our actual takeoff runway is over here at tree left. So we're actually going to go this way, follow the runway, and then come around the corner. It's just kind of interesting how that works. We'll go ahead and disengage the parking brake. And we're going to go ahead and push the throttles just a tiny bit forward. Now that that's going, I'm going to go ahead and get everything else set up. I'm going to turn to my flight director. We're going to need that. It does not take much power to get this thing rolling, trust me. Uh, keep in mind, we are very close. We're about 75% of maximum weight here because we are carrying quite a few holiday makers in the back today. Go ahead and get this thing rolling just enough. I usually tell people we're going pretty quick. By the way, remember you're very wide, so always be constantly checking out your windows. People in VR have a much easier time with this because they can just look. I'm just going to go ahead and proceed. There's a couple other little things we'd have to be thinking about. We'd have to be thinking about our rejected takeoff, which uh, you can see our auto brake is already pre preset to the maximum mode. Uh, basically what that does is in the event that we pull the throttle back during takeoff, it'll jam on the brakes for us. The other thing we can do while we're getting here is I'll go ahead and set this to arc mode. I'll set my range to 40 nautical miles is what I like. I'll put the terrain on once we get a little bit closer. Just going to go check it out. Again, we didn't ask for permission to go. Well, you're welcome to do that on your own. And we're going to be using a runway as a taxiway, which is naughty. Now I'm just going to enjoy a nice little thrust. You can see I barely got the throttles cracked here. I'm using my feet here. In the real world, of course, you, uh, we're going to be using the handy dandy tiller, which is right down there on the left. Uh, we don't have that capability. It's just kind of built in. All right. When you're in an Airbus, you want to go out and then turn. As you can see, I did not follow the yellow line. I went out and then turned. Uh, this technique requires a little bit of practice. And obviously, the bigger and scarier the airline that you're flying, the more out and turn you are. If you actually look at the aircraft from the back, you'll note that this the wheel that we pivot on is behind us. So you have to imagine your turning point is back here as opposed to in the front of the aircraft. Otherwise, um, you're going to do it at least twice as you're going to overrun the grass by accident as you're trying to take a corner. Uh, that's just a general piece of airliner advice. And obviously, if you're in a 747, remember you're like 50, 60 feet off the ground anyway. So that definitely impacts you know, your ability to perceive the stuff on the ground. So I'm taxiing pretty quickly here. Again, I'm using just gentle feet. Remember, you are a heavy airplane. You know, our gross weight here is uh, pretty staggering. Uh, it's a 64,000 kilograms right now. You know, we don't weigh 2,500 pounds like we do when we're flying, like a little Cessna or something like that. This thing is heavy. 
So we're just going to proceed on a little taxi here. Again, a pretty good little run. If you see the speed starting to get indicated and there's no serious wind, um, that would make me a little bit nervous. That would simply suggest that you're probably going a little bit harder. Um, when you're really, really heavy like this too, sometimes you have to kind of keep the throttle cracked a little bit. You can't just let go of the brake and hope the thing accelerates. Of course, the bigger and heavier you are, it seems that the wind is now no longer favoring three left. But hey, we're just doing what air traffic control asked us to do originally. Interesting how that plays out. But <laughs> welcome to the real world with real wind. Obviously, I think we're having an issue with flight simulator here on account of the fact that this says 3992. So um, there's, there's more than one thing going on here. But again, you can work with it if, with working in your particular situation. All right, we're going to take a nice gentle turn. And then we're going to wait till we go out. And then we're going to go after the turn. As you can see, I've kind of waited. This is a really, really good turn coming up here in a second here. Sorry about the glitch. All right, we're just going to come out and push our nose over. And there is our beautiful, beautiful runway. All right, go ahead and straighten our heads out. Going to go ahead and hold on the brakes a little bit. And now uh, we are in a great spot. Normally in the real world, this is uh, where we want to go ahead and kind of get confirm our flaps. Remember, we're doing a flapless takeoff here. Uh, the interesting thing is, you want to see something weird? If you go to performance, click these buttons to get our flap speeds. Watch what happens if I put the flaps down. Hmm. <laughs> interesting now uh, you can go figure out why it does that i'm pretty sure that's a well-known bug okay so we're going to go confirm that the approach is clear i've already accidentally uh, crossed the line i'm not supposed to cross there but that's okay we went a little bit wide there but it was having a basically a key binding issue okay so now that we're ready to take off what we're going to do is we're going to stick our head up we're going to go ahead and extend our landing lights we're going to go ahead and flip our nose light to take off we're going to put our strobe mode on auto you can of course you can slap that to the on key if you prefer the strobe light is one of those things that's always on when you touch the first runway and it's always off after you leave the first runway uh, once that is done all we have to do now is gently taxi our way onto the runway go ahead and check to make sure everything's looking good here i'm looking pretty good give myself just a little bit of power accidentally hit the reverse check the approach approach is clear it is going up pretty nice and gently this is a pretty big pretty powerful aircraft and i love the fact that the wind literally did a 180. <laughs> That normally would not be what you want to do, but again, we could always go into the FMS. Remember, you're going out into the right here, and normally when you're on a runway, you want to spend as little time on that runway as you possibly can, but um, we're going to, again, we're doing this thing for the purposes of just kind of taking a look at it. All right, line yourself up at the center line. Try to do the best you can to keep that front wheel as straight as possible. You don't want that thing to be at a funny angle when you start accelerating. All right, let's go do our last checks. We want to make sure our system for our TCAS, our ATC, is all set up, our transponder. We want to make sure that our lights are set up correctly. Uh, normally, what we would do is you'd reach over here and we slap on the chrono button which activates the timer so we can see how we're doing so far right now everything's ready to go okay takeoff on this is a little weird um for this particular aircraft remember we have this fancy fancy auto throttle right here what we're going to do is we're going to push this throttle up a little bit and confirm that both engines are turning the correct speed and then we're going to push this little notch until it gets locked into our appropriate um notch for our takeoff here so what we're going to do is we have cl which is our climb power Flex, or maximum continuous power, is based on our temperature we dialed into our FMS. Toga is going to be, give us everything this engine can give us right now. You cannot overpower these engines like you can at some other aircraft. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to push the throttles halfway forward, and we're going to observe our two engines to make sure they spin up together. Notice how they're not evenly spinning up. That's very, very, very common. Smoothly push it up to climb, smoothly push it up to flex. Just if you're a little tiny click, and then the aircraft should be on its way. All right, give yourself just a little bit of foot here. Um, this thing is not going to be all torquey like a single-engine aircraft. And we're just going to watch the airspeed slowly climb upwards. Again, we're not going for any excessive speed here. We're just waiting until we get to our correct speed. My hand is on the throttle for emergency purposes pretty much at all times. It's 120 knots. There's our 140 knots, which is going to be our decision speed. Uh, we're not going to do anything until we cross that line. And remember, 145 is our rotation speed, so we're going to pull back on the stick. And the aircraft is going to smoothly come up. Oh, there we go. Hold the nose up. The aircraft will come up when it is ready for takeoff. Everybody goes whoosh. As soon as you see a positive rate of climb, which we did, we're going to go ahead and lift up the landing gear. And now the aircraft is going to smoothly go into the air. 
Now this is one of the big differences between a fly-by-wire aircraft and a traditional aircraft is there's no trim. When you pull the control back, you're di dictating to the flight management computer, I should say, the um, fly-by-wire system, how many Gs of force I want you to be putting into a specific turn. So in this case, when I tilt the plane, I'm simply saying I want to use that much tilt. If I bring my controller back to center like I just did, you'll notice this one's not moving at all. It will hold you at that position. I'm going to go ahead and move my head down here so you can see how this works. Fly-by-wire aircraft are very, very different in this regard. You know, once I get the nose right where I want it to be, let's say I want to put it right here. If I let go, it keeps you there. That's a big, 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 big difference from people who fly traditional aircraft. And it's something you're going to have to kind of get used to. So the nice thing is because we do have a good flight director, we can go ahead and just sort of follow it. When we're ready to flip on the automatic pilot, we can reach over and press the AP1 button. And now the automatic pilot has been engaged. The next thing that's going to happen is you're going to get a lever that's going to say lever climb. It is reminding you to put the power now back to the climb detent. So I'm going to pull this back. It'll go click, snap into the climb detent. Our engines will slow down a tiny bit. And now this little thing will say throttle climb. This aircraft is now completely on automatic control. And we get a beautiful, beautiful look of the lake as we're kind of kind of zipping out here. Like I said, Maricaibo, that you can kind of enjoy in this part of the country in northern South America. So uh, next time what we'll do is we'll take a look at, you know, kind of the cruise and descent procedures, kind of uh, looking at what that's going to look like but for now we've gotten ourselves uh, safely up in the air uh, one thing you do want to keep in mind is that uh, when you do cross 10,000 feet you want to reach up above your head and you want to go ahead and shut off all of your uh, landing lights as well i'm just going to do that real quickly now oh there we go so that that goes on if you did have your ap on for some reason this would be a good time to shut that off and of course whoop I should shut that off. I'm sorry, I should have shut that off a while ago. And of course, if you're in any sort of rain or anything along those lines, it's highly recommended that you leave this on ignition start so that you can keep that little spark going inside your engine in the event that you run into a situation where, you know, you suck in some wind and it causes a flame out in one of the engines. But other than that, the aircraft is completely automatic. Although I noticed over here, at some point I must have clicked this by accident, I unmanaged the speed. And as soon as I did that, you'll notice that even though I was under 10,000 feet, the aircraft brought me up to 300 knots. So again, Again, it's uh, difficult to talk and fly, but there's something you have to kind of keep an eye out for. I must, like I said, hit that with my mouse or something like that when I was clicking on it, and it switched to a different speed. Remember, you're supposed to be doing less than 250 under 10,000, so uh, there's my big nasty red flag and a warning for folks at home. Other than that, uh, next time we'll take a look at uh, cruising with this aircraft descent, and of course, approach. Enjoy.